Uh, hi, welcome everybody uh, to our first seminar of the year. Uh, I would like to encourage actually uh, inputs from uh, people just uh, so that you know, from people who would like to see somebody featured and in the future, just send me an email and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take that into consideration and uh, see if we can invite the person. And uh, today it's my pleasure to introduce our very own uh, Professor Joe Trussell from Electrical Engineering. Uh, Professor Trussell, of course, uh, started uh, uh, his career many years ago here at NC State. And uh, he started at Los Alamos uh, uh, Labs and then uh, subsequently uh, went to Georgia Tech where, um, Georgia Tech and then University of Florida, I think, yes. where uh, he got a, his PhD and held uh, several visiting uh, posi uh, professor positions at, uh, uh, at uh, several universities. He's an IEEE fellow. Uh, he's a very accomplished researcher, and I'm not going to dwell too much on all the uh, the awards and, and, and merits that he has accumulated over the years. It's a pleasure to have him talk to us uh, about uh, uh, projector displays that uh, he uh, research that he carried out while on sabbatical at HP Labs in Palo Alto. Uh, it's a pleasure. Thank you for coming. The floor is yours. Okay. Thank you, Hamid. Um, the um, uh, seminar today is a, uh, is, a, is a classic, what did you do on your summer vacation? Um, I, I spent last year on sabbatical, six months at Trinity College, Cambridge University, and six months at the HP laboratories in Palo Alto. Um, neither place was a hardship tour. and. Uh, I came away with enough stories to bore a lot of people for a long time, and you get the benefit of that. Now, as one of the things that we're actually doing now, uh, this also is doubling as an IEEE uh, signal processing chapter meeting. So we're, we're, we're broadcasting this, streaming the video to several places uh, out in the uh, RTP. So I will send greetings to my fellow signal processing chapter members. Now, because of that, then, we have to keep a record of how many IEEE members do I have in the room. Would you give me a quick hands up? OK. How many student members do I have? How many student members do I have? Oh, no. Did you go raise your hands with members before? <laughs> okay. How many student members? Let's run that one again then. Okay. And the rest are just visitors, you know, which we're happy to have. All right. Now, um, when uh, I went out to HP Labs, I was working with a, um, a couple of people who had developed this multi-projector uh, system. And basically, my part of it was to deal with the color aspects. But um, what I'm going to do today is to give you an overview of the entire system. And one of the things that I don't want to do is throw up lots of equations and tell you the details. I'm going to throw some equations up there, but it's more to give you the flavor of the type of uh, mathematics that are involved here. What, what kind of optimization, what kind of math is necessary uh, for this. So, the idea here is that people wanted to put out a very large area display. And they wanted to do it without having to have IMAX cameras there. So the question is, OK, can we do this with relatively cheap, off-the-shelf um, room projection devices? In other words, you know, when we're projecting here, we're, we've got a, a little device up there. Hey, that works fine. That's exactly what we're trying to, to use. Um, but you want lots of them because you want to fill up a, uh, an entire uh, wall. Now, interestingly enough, the, the people out at HP were getting you know, people coming up and saying, hey, you know, can we buy one of these things? And it was interesting to me to find out that the number one 
customer or potential customer, they were not selling them yet, were the oil companies. What the oil companies do is they have these huge meeting rooms and they, they put up the you know, geographic or geological data and then everybody stands around and discusses them there. And they have a lot of money and they can afford this sort of thing. Now mind you, the object here is that we're making something that's much less expensive. Um, these devices that you see up there are somewhere between one and two thousand dollars a piece. There, the bulb for them is about seven hundred. But if you think about what it would take to get a big camera, I mean a big projector that would project on this wall from the back of the room, you're, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars. So the idea is can you do that cheaper? And of course the answer is, is, is yes. Um, the idea then is that you, you have a whole bunch of projectors, but then the idea is that you have to overlap them and then you have to adjust them so that they put seams together. Now, in the case here, which everybody's seen, you basically can just put up a whole bunch of displays and just hack up the picture and put it out there. Um, but that leaves you know, bars in the middle of the picture, which is not good. You'd like a continuous display. So two main aspects is that if you have multiple projectors, you've got to get your geometry right, and you've got to get your color and luminance correct. Make the adjustments then in the camera, in the projector, so that they blend together. So, you have a couple of ways to do this. Um, you can just tile them together to spread out. And uh, this gives most wall, wall displays will able to, to have a, uh, something easy to work with. In fact, there's a, a sub-project to what do you do if you have a textured wall like the ones on the side here. You don't have a great screen. Can you remove the texture from the wall? Another neat little application here. So, um, problems that you wind up with is that clearly you have to blend the seams together. Um, you have to have robustness. Suppose a projector goes out. Okay? Can you handle the case that that, you know, that happens? So you have your overlapping, one goes out, can you re in software, can you reconfigure the situation there? And brightness is a problem. You'd like to have you know, more brightness. Well, well, brightness has a, an advantage if I just take multiple projectors and put them on the same spot. Then I get, in this case, you know, three times the brightness, which is, you know, good things there. Um, challenges here, though, is that if you project these things like that, then you have to worry about which project pixels are being projected where. And you have a potential then for, for, for blurring the picture. Now, it turns out that this is actually an advantage because what you can do with this overprojection is, in fact, super resolution. Okay, now a lot of the systems that are on the market now basically require the setup people to adjust the camera positions so that they have to uh, manually go in and, and set things up so they blend in right. The advantage to this one is that it's going to be done in, in a software situation. Now, most of these projectors um, work with a reflective chip. Um, TI makes the most of them there, but it's basically a micro mirror device that uh, you, you have a little mirror that's um, on a chip and it basically flips back and forth. And the longer it stays pointed toward the screen, the brighter the picture pixel is, okay? But then it just takes the, it goes away and bounces the light somewhere else. That, that's sort of an interesting problem because that light doesn't just go away, okay? There's still some residual blackness that has to be taken care of. But because this little is a micro mirror device, um, your, your picture, actually you can see the pixels when you uh, get up close to one of these things. This is a blow up that shows that it, everything looks like a little square that has a little outline in it. 
And so people have to worry about, well, what do you do in these cases when you have these little bitty squares there? Can you get rid of them there? Well, if you overproject, then you can get rid of those, but then you risk blurring. But what I can say is that you can, with a multi-projector system, then achieve higher resolution. You can not only get rid of some of your uh, projector artifacts, but you can achieve better resolution than the project a single projector was in the first case. Okay. Now, here's a type of thing that, that comes in, you know, that you'd like to have. Hey, you know, super cinemascope, I guess, um, you have. Four projectors, you know, one high, one deep. We're not having any overlap. Deep is an overlap type of thing. Put it up there. And obviously, this is a picture of this, the system that worked. Okay, we're not just putting out something here that's funny. So it's sort of interesting to find out the visual effects that people are taking advantage of with this type of a display. Um, the system we actually were putting out a lot of uh, was this 12 projector system. So, so it's four wide, okay, and three deep. So at each point you've got three projectors, so you're getting good smooth images produced there. You can run this system so that it actually runs it at, at 60 frames per second. You can do real-time video. All the computations that are being done then are being done so that you can have standard video. This is an Xbox type uh, video display here that they were using. The geometry of the system then is really variable. And while I can tell you I saw this, <laughs> You just have to sort of believe me in, in saying it was truly impressive that somebody sits in front and says, well, you've got this wall that's sort of an obvious shape, but the all, wall actually has a 90-degree bend in it there. But if you're sitting out over here looking this way, then this is what you'd see. It comes out. You can take it, you know, this geometry, you can warp it then to fit whatever wall you happen to come across then. Oh, another interesting observation was, was when I mentioned the oil companies there. The, um, <clears throat> the other people who were knocking on the door, it turned out to be, was um, BMW. They want to put these displays in their showrooms there. If you can afford a BMW, they can afford to entertain you with, with you know, high-quality graphics there. And incidentally, the, the last one turned out to be um, uh, Walt Disney for their theme park rides. What you can do is you can obviously take a great big area here and project it, and you can get one of these theme rides then where you're totally immersed. It's basically the IMAX experience, okay, in a much smaller environment. In other words, your entire field of view is taken up with the picture, so you have no reference, so you get into it there. Like I say, that was really impressive. Now, okay, a little math then. So, what I'm doing is that I have a whole bunch of projectors then, and I have to drive the, the projector. So in this case, K of them, they're all going to be combined over here to produce this composite image. So in essence, what I want to do is I want to take the image that I want to display, and then I want to back it out and determine what's the input to each of these projectors. Now, there are several things we have to worry about then. Um, the first one we talked about was the geometry. In other words, the projectors are not um, exactly positioned. That geometry of the where a pixel is in one projector and where that same pixel lies in the other projector, putting them together then in a coordinate system then uh, is required then. And so there is a geometry correction then for each of the projectors down here. 
Each one of them has a luminance correction and a color correction. Now, if you're really into color, when I say color, that really has a luminance chrominance component there. What we're really doing is we're separating out the luminance part of that and keeping the chrominance separate then. The chrominance then is determined by the individual projector characteristics. And while projectors are made by the same manufacturer, what they have is a white light and then they have a color wheel that has either three or four segments. Then if it's a three segment projector, you have an R, a red, green, blue. And those are not necessarily equal areas for the, uh, the system. But, uh, but they also, for displays, they have a red, green, blue, and a white segment that's clear. The reason for that is that for a lot of the displays, like this one, what you want to do is maximize your contrast. So I don't want to have to have you know, a piece of red, a piece of green, and a piece of blue all putting together to make this white. I can do that, but it's more efficient to just hit it with white on that. So for this kind of thing, it works really well. Now, I don't know what this projector is actually set at. It probably has uh, both settings. It ha it'll have what they call a, uh, a video setting, which is just using the R, G, and B portions of the filter wheel. Uh, and then it will have a presentation setting, which will use the uh, uh, R, G, B, and the white segment to it. So you can get both. I mean, those we put up uh, color pictures before, and they look like color pictures to you. So um, they obviously have something on that order. So, the, each projector then has to have you know, the characterization done, and these are different. Even though they have the same manufacturer, their colors will vary slightly. Their bulbs age, and that shifts things slightly. The luminance, of course, depends something on the geometry also, because the uh, projectors are in different places. Okay. So, so when they come, they have a different fall-off distance from the, uh, from the screen. And that luminance, then, is a uh, two-dimensional. It varies in two dimensions there. And then there's a, a, a black offset that has to be taken into account, because even if you put zeros into the projector, then what you're going to get out is some light on the screen. Now, normally this is not a big problem. We have enough ambient light around here, so that if I put up you know, nothing but zeros, then it would look pretty black to you. But if you're playing the game of a, uh, say, a theme park ride, where you're in a dark environment, you're in a controlled environment, then that black offset will come into play. Your eyes will adjust to that. OK. Um, this is just nothing but, but what I talked my way through before then. Um, the color transformation is something that I worked on. I had to sit then do uh, measurements of the projectors, uh, measurements of the overlapping, determine whether they actually behave in a linear way or nonlinear way. You know, can, can we assume that things add properly? Um, you have a, a you know, RGB in the color then, it turns out that, that despite the fact that you have an RG and a B and a white in the filter, you can only input RGB into the projector. They don't let you at that white one, which is very frustrating for me. Okay. So the object here that we are looking at is that in order to get this system working, we have to make some measurements on it. Now, the neat thing here is that the, the system is basically set up so that it can be self-calibrating. Okay? You set up the projectors, you put them on the screen, you get them to overlap roughly the way you want, and then you leave them alone. And the rest is taken up then by software. So, 
Each one of the projectors then is turned on, put through its little paces, puts up a grid, measure the grid, measure the color luminance characteristics of it. And what they're doing is they're basically taking all these measurements with a camera there. In other words, you have to have a camera that's set back and sees the entire screen. Now, the camera does not need to be as high resolution as the pixels on the screen, but it has to cover everything. Okay? You can you know, get your geometry right from all sorts of nice correlation things. It's, it's sort of like you know, the sub-pixel registration that, that people do with, with you know, uh, frames and so forth. That we have you know, one sampling, we have another sampling of a uh, satellite photo, and they put them over and they say, well, these, these are overlapped, this is how you match them, and they're, they're matched within you know, you know, one-third of a pixel. So you can do that with, with the right statistical portions there. So um, you put up the geometry so that you know where the camera is, where the projector is putting things on the screen and you're measuring them with your camera. So, and that's basically nice geometry. When you have cameras, you're going to have an overlap so you get you know, a, a bright portion, then the cameras overlap, they're going to get twice as much light in the middle. And you also have the same thing happen at the other end with the black portion of the system then. Um, when they're all turned off, they're putting out some light, and where they overlap, they're going to have you know, a relatively bright spot. There's, a, um, you know, there's some research doing on, on what kind of coded patterns you use, what's best to uh, get the highest resolution and most accurate uh, registration of the systems there. Um, high resolution, th this is what we're talking about the screen then. This is the image that I want to display. Low resolution, this is each one of my little projectors back there. So what I have to do is I have to take a look and see, okay, what do I want to put out in a pixel for this, how does that map back into my low resolution space, how do I make the uh, weighted averaged co combination because it, it's you know partial there. Okay, um, Brightness, th this is one of the things that I, of course I found fascinating because it has to do with the um, uh, visual system and, and what the visual system will will tolerate for uh, viewing. So in this case they will have the color chrominance properties and then they'll have a luminance property. And what you have then is a desired luminance map for the whole picture. Um, that necessarily is not going to be a uniform across the, the screen. The object is that, that, look, you can't tell the difference in a very s slowly varying illumination and one that's actually flat there. It'll look the same to you. The idea on the, the Luminance, then, is what you want to do is you want to maximize the contrast. In other words, you want to give the most light out that you can so that it produces a subjective smoothness. In other words, the, the picture that I showed you at first with the waterfall and such there looked like a very smooth gradation there. But in fact, there are parts of it that were at least twice as bright as other parts there. You simply didn't notice it there. Okay, solved by linear programming techniques. In other words, what we need to do is we need to find this luminance map. The color maps are a little bit different from there. But the idea is that over here, for instance, at the bright end, when I turn the projectors on all the way, then they have a non-uniform grade of just how the one projector lies along the screen, 
then where the two projectors overlap, okay, then I get another addition to that. And then the other projector then falls over in this region. So if I wanted to produce something that says, well, let's make sure that it is smooth, I could take the system and just move it across like this. In other words, make it uniform, but that would be throwing away a lot of light and a lot of my quantized bits. What is necessary, though, is that that luminance map then is indeed smooth. So it's smooth to the eye. In other words, I don't want to have this kind of a uh, brightness edge in my uh, final picture. My eye can detect that. But it can't detect this much. Now it turns out we can also you know, push this up a little bit and do some other things. Um, there's actually a, 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 an optimization in here, which I will not go into in real horrible detail. The same thing is true down at the bottom. Okay? In other words, the black point of one projector, the black point of the other projector, and then, of course, where the projectors overlap, they go up. Well, I have to then smoothly bring this down. So I'm bounded between the upper bound on the luminance and the lower bound on the luminance, and that's where I have to work my luminance. Okay. Now, when you have a system, what you can do is that you can take your system into the projector, it goes into a common color transformation here. In other words, what I'll do is I'll find a common color gamut that all the projectors can handle, which reduces the gamut somewhat. But we haven't found a good way to get around that one yet. But then once I find the, the right color transformation, then to put it in there, then each one of the projectors gets a correction for itself so that it can handle it. In other words, this the color gamut that's represented by this one is within the color gamut of each of the projectors here. Once I find that one, then I can put it back out then. The luminance portion then of this is handled in two ways. I have a the black offset, okay, and then I have the luminance map here. Note that this is after we've done the geometric correction. So I have a geometric corrections in there. What I'm looking for is to optimize according to the L, okay? And then the black offset is the bottom there. So the optimization that you do, all right, has to include some force smoothness. In other words, remember, I'm, I'm working on optimizing the, the L and then I wind up getting what goes into the projector here, there. So here's the projector coming in, okay? This is what feeds into the projector. This is my original image. That's my high resolution part of the image. And then this is the luminance map. In other words, my original image was usually going to be uniform all the way across, but what I'm trying to do is to vary that luminance according to what my projectors can put out. So I don't want to reproduce the original image. Okay? I want to produce a luminance-weighted version of the original image there. Um, subject two, I have to be able to put this within the range of output values that I have. And the blending maps then for each one of the projectors. And we're also, one of the things that you have when you're doing the blending, okay, you, you want to have not only continuity, but you've got to have continuity of the first derivative too. Okay? It, it's the old, you know, 
I, I can tell if I have, you know, an absolute value type function. It'll come out and I can append it. So I want to, you know, smoothly roll it off there. So we, in essence, you know, put that into the function we're dealing with then. So solve for the illuminance correction then, and then solve for the input function then. We can determine what's up there. Um, here's a little 1D type of a, an illustration about this luminance correction then. What was previously done was sort of, you know, say I'll take this one projector, and then it can produce over here, but I need to taper it off so that I get a smooth curve. So this, this was done before. Um, there were some other little things that were done before you could actually get a little bit more light out, but you had this discontinu uh, discontinuity in the derivative, which actually showed up. It uh, wasn't good. Furthermore, you have some discontinuities in the um, input function that you're driving with, that's not a good thing to have from a practical standpoint. The optimality according to the equations that we said before then would result in something that is much more of this line here. I get the in increased luminance coming out of the projectors there. Smoothness though varies so it, it's better than that from smoothness and puts out more light than that one. So if I separate the two projectors, they look something like this then. In other words, this one would be a left side, this is a middle one, and I, I haven't shown the right side projector for this. But basically, you know, you have to overlap. So this part then is going to be by <coughs> Projector two by itself. You know, this part here is going to be projector one by itself. And then as they overlap, this would be overlapped with this and so forth. So you can see how they smoothly taper off. All right. Um, resolution enhancement then. Um, once we have our luminance maps then together, you know, what can we do to change the, the pixel uh, going into the system? This turns out to be a, an interesting uh, filter bank problem, basically looking at it in terms of a high pass and low pass uh, filter. The ideas then are pretty much the same as what we had if you're doing super resolution, which people have been doing for, for quite a while. They've been taking successive frames of uh, television cameras, which have a very low resolution, um, 640 by 480, and sometimes lower than that. <clears throat> but if your scene doesn't change uh, significantly, and you can get slightly different you know, front views, then you can combine those together and increase your resolution. This is pretty much what you know, I showed you previously. What I didn't show you before was that this is the result then of about 10 superimposed projectors. Now, one of the things that I note here is that those projectors then you know, are not specially positioned. I mean, there's a certain amount of randomness uh, that you have in there. If you have 10 of them, you're going to get a certain amount of randomness, which allows the overlap that you have. I mean, Certainly, if you had 10 projectors and they were all calibrated so that they all matched exactly the same pixels, you wouldn't get anything except brightness out. So the idea then is that, you know, what can you obtain? If you're looking for, for a nice little, you know, esoteric research problem, then you could look at this in terms of, of the randomness, how much randomness is required in order to achieve how much resolution increase. No shortage of interesting little problems that you can get on this. Um, luminance and color then are decoupled. We've already taken the luminance out. Now we want to have the uh, color. And I've used the term before, but basically what we do is we take the chrominance map of each one of the projectors and we'll look at the intersection of that. 
Now, I think there's some better ways to do that, but in the six months I had to work at HP, um, that one didn't get a lot of time in there. And it was how do you combine uh, different color gamuts and you know, can you gain anything by extending the color gamut uh, that you're working with. So, now, I mentioned that the projector then have nonlinear mappings that are not well represented by uh, the models. When the projectors are doing their video display, then they're running RGB, and they're pretty well behaved. They're uh, linear uh, for the most part. In other words, I've measured them with a spectral radiometer. Um, I've looked at the uh, output of the camera that we're using to um, measure these things, and except for the fact that the projector does have a gamma uh, associated with it, as do most displays, then usually a gamma of about 2.2. Then things are, are reasonably good. You, you can you know, do the manipulation, you can do the adding. However, the um, nonlinearities come in when you start going into the presentation mode. Now, talk about that then and show you what sort of things can happen. Now, this is what we're talking about with just the um, various in the, in the gamma side. So this is just the, um, <clears throat> in this case, it's just the RG space. And we, we didn't go into XYZ and use X, <clears throat> XY. But it shows you that, that, you know, the standard format for a video image now is an RGB, but it's a calibrated RGB. There is a uh, sRGB format, which is related then to the CIE color standards there. However, the gamma that is assumed by the sRGB does not mean that the projector then actually can cover that gamma then. In other words, if my image has a point out here, then I can't reproduce that chromaticity. I have to use something else there. So there, there's a little manipulation that, that goes on. And so what will have to generally happen is I have to just reduce the gamut of my projector in order to, um, well, put it this way, I can't extend my projector. Okay, And then if I change the image into here, then I have done color warping on the uh, image. So there's a danger that I will get things that look different as far as the color goes there. Um, fortunately, the, the eye is pretty tolerant uh, on that. Finally, we're getting something that I actually did. <laughs> okay. Um, in making the measurements for the projectors, then, we determine then, okay, the target grid, in this case the um, sRGB gamut here, and then the inside is the gamut then of the projector coming out. So what happens, you have a three-dimensional, it's okay, it's R, G, and B, and then we try to see, well, what can we hit and what can we not? In order to do this, you have to kind of look at a three-dimensional solid by rotating it around here. And so I look at this one, but then if I turned it on its side, you can see that there's a lot of space on each side. I can't get out to that, okay? Which means that, that my colors are, are going to suffer uh, the consequences. Um, this is in a nice linear space. Actually, we, we'd look at uh, the LAB parameters. LAB then is what they call a uniform color space in that differences in the LAB space correspond to perceptual differences there, um, at least approximately. Over here, geometric differences, how far that is off, doesn't reflect that that may be a large perceptual difference. I may not be able to, to see it. However, what we can see is that if we go into LAB space, then we still have significant problems. Okay? 
um, down in the, in the blue range and in the red up here. Um, one of the problems is that, that the, the red filters are fairly narrow, and as a result, they really cut down the light uh, a, a lot. So to compensate for that a little bit, the red area of that color filter wheel is made bigger. Okay, that'll give you a little proportionally more light. Um, but it still has a, uh, you know, a problem. It doesn't put out you know, as much light as we would like it to. So we have to then worry about, you know, how do I do my mapping just for that? Typically, there are several what they call gamut mapping algorithms then. So that you, if you have a point out here, you can map it back in by looking at the closest point, although that's usually not the most optimal visually uh, to work with. Now, um, if we go into projection mode, okay, presentation mode, then we're using the white component of the, uh, the filter wheel. And one of the things you get into there then is, um, you know, the sRGB things comes out here, but the projector then produces things way out here in the white. Okay, it, it, it's really way out there. Now, I could have done two things. I could have taken the maximum white and mapped it on to, to this point, but that would blow a lot of what I... Uh, have to work on too because everything else would get mapped onto this very little small area here. So the question then is um, how do you handle uh, the projection mode, the presentation mode, um, which is one of the things that, that we spent a, a fair amount of time the last uh, month and a half doing. And so, you know, here, here's where we're actually still talking to each other and uh, have, having fun in that respect. Then, what happens is sort of interesting in this mapping though, is that within the pure R, pure G, or pure B, okay, the red, green, and blue primaries, the projector will actually behave in a fairly linear manner. It comes along and, and does a, a, a nice job there. So I'm not losing color saturation in that area. What will happen, though, is when I start combining the red, green, and blue, and if I try to start making a white out of this, then it assumes I'm going into projection mode here, and it wants to produce a very bright image. And so what happens then is this thing starts going out here and says, okay, I can produce this thing. And it's about four times the brightness of what the red, green, and blue do. If I look at that in terms of a gamma okay, on the projector, the usual gamma is about a 2.2. The gamma for the projection mode here is about a 4-something there. Now, we then have to worry about characterizing the transformation here. Okay? Projector input is only R, G, and B. You know, I would love to have access to how much the white point is there. That would make my life easy. It'd put the problem back into the half-toning algorithms where I have cyan, magenta, yellow, and black inks to work on. We can work in four. Hey, that's great. But I can't get access to that. They don't build projectors with that access. So, question then is, how do we characterize the transformation and do it in a time that is reasonably compatible with setting up the projector? In the RGB mode, the total time for setup for one of these systems with, say, the um, 12 projector system is about 20 minutes. In other words, it basically, you, it just runs the, the samples then, does all its calculations, you know, it takes time to make a measurement, but then it's ready to go in about 20 minutes, okay? And this doesn't require, you know, a lot of detail set up by the people. So the computation that you go in to do this sort of thing needs to be relatively fast. 
there. What's the optimal sampling on this? I can't take too many samples. It takes too much time. So typically, 9 by 9 by 9 grids are used. And you're going to develop then a, a 3D lookup table so that the, uh, the, the, the system will actually handle huge nonlinearities. But the grid system that you're using, 9 by 9 by 9, Remember, the input to this thing is 256 by 256 by 256. So you have to be able to handle that nonlinear transformation and the interpolation systems that you have have to handle that. OK? Um, is it possible to pre-warp the data to get effective quantization? In other words, um, this is what I get if I input you know, this 9 by 9 by 9, but I measure what's coming out of that. Well. Would I be better off looking at my 9x9x9, nine by nine by nine, but putting more information out in this region here so I get the, uh, non, the highest nonlinearity covered when I do my interpolation there? Um, best interpolations to use, and what are the timing constraints? In other words, if I have um, high dimensional spline interpolators, which are you know, really nice, but they cost a lot, okay? Um, and I've got to keep this thing at 60 frames per second. So I have to be able to do this on the fly here. Um, best mapping from RGB space, okay? That defines most of the images there, into the projector gamut there, okay? This is the gamut mapping we're talking about previously, but before we were looking about, oh, gee, I've got to move this to that. Now I've got to move this thing way out here. Okay, how do I do it? You know, what am I willing to sacrifice in color fidelity in order to make this picture? And what's going to be noticeable then to, a vis <coughs> to, the, to the viewer? Okay? Um, a question which was interesting discussions with uh, several of the, uh, the people out there in our group, which was um, multimedia and uh, imaging, and we went over to the color printing division and talked to them about, well, how do you want to judge fidelity? How do I determine whether the uh, picture is a good representation or not there? Once you've gotten away from exact measurements, okay, I can take, you know, gee, LAB and LAB, that, that's great. But now I'm not even in the same domain. I know I'm going to be making significant color errors in here. How bad or how good are those representations going to be? All right. Um, best way to utilize that extended brightness then. Okay. Um, we may have to throw some of it away to get back in here. Um, in looking at the output of this, we, we displayed images with the standard um, video mode, and then we kept the same picture up there, and we just put the projector in um, presentation mode. What appears is that the whites then start to really glow. And for the images we saw, the color saturation didn't decrease noticeably. Now, I'm sure you can find cases where this is true, but it sort of enhanced the brightness of things there. Um, the eye will tolerate a lot along that line, and, but we need to have some way of actually uh, quantizing or know which way we can go in order to get a real system there. Okay, throw things optimally, okay? Ultimately, this is the thing. You wind up getting your, your system here, put it together, nonlinear mappings and so forth. You wind up with a system that has overlapping. You take it all into account. You can produce something that produces a nice, smooth image. In other words, yeah, I'm going to throw out this part, okay? I'm going to reduce this brightness, okay? But keep it long. What you'll find out is that this brightness line here, this brightness line there, it is in fact brighter 
than it is over there. Okay? I could measure that and show it. Everything is running now on a single okay, general processor. All right. Um, a little advertisement for HP and, uh, and their group then is that the system is automatic. Okay? It's flexible. It'll handle arbitrary configurations. You don't have to you know, do anything different if you're going to have a 3 by 4 system. Okay? Or a 1 by 4 system. It'll do it all day. Everything runs in real time and okay, it's nice and visible. We'll go along with that. Um, anything you want to see, you can go out and, and go to the HP website and um, Nelson and uh, Naranjan will be, you know, on there smiling at you and telling you good things. All right? So I'm going to stop here. And uh, we can see what other questions we have. And there's a guy at the back who wants to ask a question. So and is, incidentally, you better you know talk loudly. So is this a, a company, or is it still it's trying to sell this, or is it still in the research phase? Um, Pluribus is a project that is within Hewlett Packard's laboratory. Okay, that that's what they call it. Um, so if you HPL, you know dot HP, you know it's within that. Now they're going to be. Um, getting this thing to to a point of, of spinoff where they got to decide, you know, do we do we HP want to be selling this kind of thing? Is that our market? Which is probably not the case. They'll probably license it for somebody else to do. Mm -hmm. You know, it's fascinating working with HP because you know somebody comes up with this great idea like like Pluribus and say, well, it's a market, man. You know, we, we can get ten million dollars a year out of this, and the people at HP look at them and say, "So, only ten million? <laughs> that, 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 that's sort of a, a, a drop in the bucket uh, when you're talking about these billion-dollar corporations uh, like HP. So, um, they've, they've got some other neat stuff going on, and there's no shortage of neat stuff. Uh, it was a great place to work. Anything else? Any other questions? What is the system that you use to take uh, the measurements uh, when you're setting uh, setting it up on the spot? When you're setting up the system with multiple projectors on the spot, what is the, how are you taking the measurements? I'm making measurements with, with a basically just a high resolution camera. Okay, color camera. And you've and, got and, all the and corrections and for it. I, 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 I can characterize the camera. Now the camera is not um, photometric. In other words, it, it has a, a color filter array, uh, basically a Bayer array. And so we do have to characterize what the red, green, and blue sensors are actually sensing. Okay? But there's a correction that we have to do for that, then, which, which is you know, standard. Now, when I made the measurements and I showed you the gamuts there, I was using a photometric device. I was using a spectroradiometer. So I knew exactly you know, what, what colors were out there. But I use that spectroradiometer to characterize the camera there. So there, there's, there's some neat little estimation problems that go in after the fact, too. But it's cheap. There. OK. Like I say, I had great fun. Wait up. Oh, I have a question. The commodity GPUs, do you use them like they were meant to be used, or do you have to use them in the funny modes when they're used for, say, uh, um, doing reverse uh, planning things for X-ray or uh, radiation treatment for cancers? Um, the, the 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 graphics processors that we use then um, are standard, but but they are programmed separately. In other words, so somebody goes in and actually tweaks them so they can handle the uh, uh, equations that we need to have handled. Yeah, some of them you have to do strange transformations in order to do that. Is that part of this? Uh, I could not tell you about the programming on the, the, the GPUs. Okay. okay. Um, I, I know that it was done. There was a, a, a chap who worked with the team, 
and his job was to take the algorithms that we developed in MATLAB and, and make them work on the GPU. All right. We have a question here at a and Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I, I have two questions. One is like in the tile arrangement. We, we, uh, uh, we can't make out what you're saying. Uh, I just have two questions. One is that in the tile arrangement, the okay. uh, input to the projectors are different to each projector, right? That is so, correct. Like, how do you manage? How do you manage about the inputs? Well, that that's part of the optimization problem, is that uh, the equations that I uh, put up uh, previously were optimized then for each projector, uh, very much like the. Um, the the, the uh, super resolution, in other words, what you have to do is you know what you want out, and so you optimize what goes in in order to produce the highest resolution picture that you have. So it's like that. So, but yeah, each each projector you know has to have it, its own uh, special input. Okay, so is there any prerequisite for that? I mean, any pre-calculations for that? Any pre-calculations for that? Any pre-calculation? Yeah, I mean to overlap the images or something so that they well, would. Well, yeah. Start In other words, what what you know is how the projectors overlap. So you know the geometry by doing your initial setups, and then you basically uh, know the outline of the region that you want, you adjust it for the aspect ratio of the total picture, and you divide up the uh, input then according to how much of each projector uh, overlaps with the entire uh, field. So, so that, okay. that's done at setup time, and then okay. that, doesn't, that doesn't have to be done on the fly. The only thing that has to be done on the fly is the implementation of those equations. Part of that 20 minute uh, setup that I mentioned is exactly that. Finding the geometry, determining all those transformations. So it's like a set of equations for a particular geometry? Yes, yes. The geometry is derived and then you set the parameters. In other words, the matrix calculations are all the same, I mean the form of them, the coefficients of the matrix then uh, are determined for, for each setup. And really at the beginning okay. of, of each session for each of the uh, projectors. I mean, if you uh, are, are doing it each day, then you begin at the morning and set it up. Okay, I have one more question. <laughs> uh, in case of like overlapping all the projectors on the same, same point, no, the output is basically we have a higher uh, image quality. I mean, the intensity is more. So, like, why do we go for a multiple number of projectors when you can go for a single projector with high quality uh, light illuminations? Expense. The projectors that uh, we have, like the one that's projecting here, are, are about somewhere between one and two thousand dollars. If you increase the um, brightness, and the resolution, you have to uh, increase the expense of the optics then, and the higher uh, intensity bulbs go up almost exponentially. As it is, the projector bulbs that we see here are about seven, eight hundred dollars a piece. If you're looking at the bulbs that run for um, the movie projectors, um, those, those things run several thousand dollars. So, so the idea was mainly something that's cost effective. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, one more question. Now that you mentioned that, can you do movie projection? I mean, can, can, can the movie theaters use this technology to display movies in, in, in sure. cheaper? Yeah, well, you have, you have movie projectors. Then, then, in essence, what you can do is make it smaller. You, know, you, 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 you go into these little you know, cineplexes now, and it are, they're already pretty small there. But then, then you can make it, you know, even smaller. We can make this into a to a, to a movie theater for you at, at relatively cheap. There. 
Okay. We'll go. We'll go one more. Just, just uh, then, then we'll quit. Well, let's say we have a really, uh, really large screen. I mean, an ex extremely large screen, and we want to build up with this and that, and we can no longer keep the projectors in one stack at a particular space. You have a projector that's running around the lens, one over there, one over here, one over there. And uh, then the problem would be that when you have such a large expanse and such a large screen space, the problem of taking the measurements with a single digital camera, as you said, now the you have to have a single feedback camera source to properly uh, map all the, I mean, to set up all the corrections that we talked about. That, that, that is correct in the present situation, but what was being worked on at HP then was using multiple cameras, getting your cameras to overlap, judging their fields of input so that, that you could actually do them. What this does incidentally is that if you have one camera, then it has to see the whole field. It has to be placed further back. And what they're looking at these back projection devices then that may have only four or five feet to work with, okay, it's easy enough to put the projectors in there, but then you have to have the cameras back. And so there there is a... Um, work being done on using multiple cameras to do the same thing. Okay? So yeah. No shortage of nice problems. Okay, how many? All right, let's thank our speaker.